If you watch MotoGP at all, you often hear the phrase of standing the bike up to get onto the fat part of the tire because there's more grip there. But the physicist in me had a problem with that because I knew that the contact patch, the area in contact with the ground, doesn't affect uh, how much friction is there. But if you look at cars, motorcycles, generally bigger bikes, more power, equals wider tires. So, what's going on there? So, when I first learned about friction and how the surface area, the area in contact with the ground, doesn't affect how strong the friction is, my thinking was, okay, wider tires, they must have a higher chance of some part of it gripping, but I was kind of totally wrong about it. So now one of the other big problems I have with this statement is, maybe on a car it's different, but on motorcycles, the wheels curve, they're round. So is there even more material when the bike is standing more upright? So the first rule you have to understand is the friction force, how strong the friction is, is proportional to the weight. So, at this, there'll be one level of friction with the weight of the bike pressing down. Now, if you look at it, there'll be even more force pushing down to be my mass pushing right down into the wheel. So, to break it down, friction F is equal to the friction coefficient mu, basically how sticky something is. So, rubber, for instance, would have a very high coefficient of friction where something like steel or glass would have a low coefficient of friction. So, it's a friction coefficient mu times n. n is the force acting upon it. Generally, it's gravity. It's the mass pushing down. So, when you're sitting still, it's just the weight of the bike with you sitting on it. But then you can change that. When you accelerate hard, you're gonna put more force in the rear wheel. When you brake hard, you're gonna put more force into the front wheel. So say I took my nice glass covered phone and tried to slide it along the ground. It's gonna slide pretty easy because it is a low coefficient of friction. But if you take something else like rubber, that's gonna have a really high friction coefficient. To drag this along the ground is gonna be much, much tougher than dragging some of the same mass of this. So the second law of friction, and this is the important one, is that friction is independent of the surface area, which is where this whole video idea comes from. So the famous idea with this is you get a brick with some weights trying to pull it off the table. You keep adding weights and adding weights until it moves, but then you'll find that if you rotate the brick onto its side, or even up onto its vertical end, it'll take the same amount of force each time to cause it to move. So, as counterintuitive as this is, it doesn't matter how wide this is, it doesn't matter if you've got your big 300 mil tire on the back, it's not gonna make a difference. That is to say, assuming the material and the weight stays the same, assuming everything is homogenous. So why is it independent? Well, if you think of it this way, have you ever seen a microscopic photo of pretty much any surface, we even think metal, like on the top would be nice and smooth to the touch, but then once you get down, it looks kind of like a mountain range under a microscope. It's got all of these pits and crevices and, you know, spikes. So if you take two of these surfaces and put them on top of each other, they're not gonna fully touch like we imagine it. The, the peaks and the valleys are all gonna kinda interlock in weird ways. And then the only way to increase the friction between those two, because that's what's gonna cause it, the resistance to moving, is putting more force on it so it presses harder into it and the peaks crush and force in between. Now what you could think of is if you took a second one of these mountain ranges, but to make it twice as big, but had the same weight pushing down, so the same force, the same pressure, it's not going to be able to press down as far, so the actual area in contact will still be the same. So, if you don't really get it, just take my word for it, that a heavier rider, bike, or more force pushing the bike into the ground is going to produce more friction, and that's the only way to change it, everything else being equal. So, without changing your tires, the only thing you can do to affect friction, the only thing you can change, is how much force is on it, how hard you're braking, how fast you're cornering, how hard you're accelerating. So one thing I want to cover really quickly is tire load sensitivity, because the way we've said it so far is the friction is proportional to the mass pushing out the friction coefficient. But with rubber, it doesn't technically double. It gets close, it's near double with twice the amount of force pushing it down, but it's not quite. But 
for all intents and purposes of what we're learning today, double. So then the question is, if traction is higher with the big rubber, but friction is better with smaller rubber, why aren't all bikes just using small little bicycle tires? Obviously, we can change the force a bit. We can make the bike a little bit lighter so it can corner a little bit more aggressively and so on. You can have a lighter rider or a heavier rider. That's fine. But the big thing you can change, and that's why tires are so used, is the friction coefficient. That's why you can see these super soft tires, and that's also affected by temperature. So in warmer weather, your tires will be that little bit softer than in cold weather. And vice versa, you can have slicks, you can have um, really hard touring tires. That's why if you look at photos of a tire at the end of a track day, they're shredded because they're a really soft compound just to increase the friction coefficient as much as possible. Like durability isn't a major concern. But then you get into the thing, if you had a really small tire that was also pretty soft, the second you put all the CCs from a bike like this or even a 250, like if you have a small little bicycle tire, you're gonna shred the tire straight away. Okay. So what you'll do, you'll accelerate slowly. You're totally fine, right? Not until you have to get to a corner. Then when you, once you pitch her in, the force pushing down is gonna increase a lot, especially if you're going in at any sort of speed. Rip the tire apart again. Okay, so you're only going straight lines. Now you're gonna overheat the soft tire. So, what do you do? You make the tire a little bit wider. It's gonna cool better. Because it's bigger and thicker, you're gonna be able to run softer compounds for longer because it's spread out more while still having the same level of friction. It's not going to tear itself apart because it's stronger and because it's bigger. It will dissipate the heat a little bit better so it's not going to overheat and shred itself anyway. So the traction of your bike is determined by ABC. Acceleration, braking and cornering. So if you're accelerating really hard, if this little pie chart is mostly acceleration, you're not going to have a whole lot of traction left over for braking or cornering. Obviously if you brake you can't be accelerating. You can cause a lockup, but really if you're, if you're cornering while accelerating at full gas, especially on a big bike, you're going to run out of traction. If you're braking really hard and cornering, you're going to run out of traction. If you're cornering really hard and brake, you're going to run out of traction. That's why you see a lot of front ends wipe out when people touch your front brake. That's why trail braking is such an important thing to, to learn properly. You're just feathering that, you're right on the edge of traction, where you're braking just enough for cornering as hard as you can. Both then, in conclusion, Friction is independent of the surface area, but traction is not. Because there's so many other factors at play other than just the friction holding it to the ground. So the way I was thinking about it initially was just wrong. But there you know, can you apply this to every day? Not really. I mean, if you're thinking about putting a slightly bigger tire on the back of your bike, you know you're gonna be adding a bit of weight but not really adding any friction, so you're much better if going fast and getting more grip is what you want, change the compound. So, in conclusion, what do you take away from all of this? So really, this video comes down to what tires do you have on? Do you go for something sticky that's not gonna last as long, or something a bit harder that will last you longer, but won't grip as well in the corners? We're all motorcyclists, the seasons play a lot into what we do. So I think in summer, it's perfect time to put on the sticky rubber that's only gonna last 3,000 miles, 5,000 kilometers. And then coming into now, it's fall. It's great, but the weather is definitely taking a turn for the cold. Your tires aren't gonna stick as well because they'll always be colder anyway, so you might as well put something more touring focus on. Something that will last 15,000 miles instead of three. So you can run all the way through winter. So you only end up buying two sets of tires a year. Assuming you're going for performance tires, you can get much longer if you're not using your bike as often as I am. I guess I really want to say more in this video about this. So if you have any questions, leave it down below. I will answer you as best I can. But this road is fantastic. So I'm going to go ride my bike and have some fun. I've never been on here before and it's brilliant. So I will talk to y'all later. Peace.